Um, as you, you probably, most of you know, I, I originally am from Bisbee in Tucson, so it's nice to be home. Uh, I met my wonderful husband, Bob, here, and we celebrated our engagement 32 years ago here at the Westward Look, and uh, it's, it's nice to be home. And I was very gratified when, I think Ron and Ted Maxwell reached out to me and said, we want you to come down and talk to our leadership group. And I was happy to do that this past summer and reconnect with my Southern Arizona roots and make a commitment to you all to make sure you're part of the discussion. Really appreciate the update on Rio Nuevo. I'm already getting hate emails. <laughs> so it's nice to have some people on speed dial that I can call and say, OK, tell me the real story, as opposed to the story that oftentimes comes up. That was, it is quite the storied development. And again, another reason to reach out and reconnect with my roots and my past. Very quickly, a session update. We are in the midst of crossover week, which is why I'm here and not in committee meetings. Uh, we have heard all the Senate bills in the Senate that are going to be heard, and likewise in the House. And this is the week that we are voting out most of the bills that made it out of our Senate and House committees. That makes us about halfway through. We had some, we had at the beginning of session the opioid special session in the midst of the regular session. And it was a bipartisan accomplishment to come together and unanimously adopt extensive uh, regulation, uh, just a state action plan to take on the opioid crisis, which is threatening to overwhelm us. The addiction, the problems related to that have come full face. We must act and we must act now. And it was great to be a part of a special session where there really, there was a little bit of complaining, there always is, but at the end of the day, we agreed, and the Democrat leadership was invited to join with Republican leadership in writing that legislation and, and getting it passed. The House had its own set of kerfuffles. I'm gonna leave that to Daniel to talk about, but if I had a dollar for every time I said, oh my God, thank God I'm not in the House. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd be a wealthy woman. So kudos to you, Daniel, for hanging in there. The big things that need to pop now, at the beginning of session, the governor laid out his executive budget, and we've been meeting with various groups about what's in the budget and what's not in the budget. We are getting set to start in the Senate, our small group meetings, where legislators are able to go in and meet with leadership look at the baseline budget, compare it to the governor's budget, and say, here's a priority, here's a priority, here is a priority. The front and center basis of the governor's budget is education and the restoration of district additional funding. Um, and I can talk about that. It's, it's technical, but it's been frozen since 2009. And it resulted in cuts to district schools of 85% of that a pot of money. 15% for charter schools. So to be able to front end load some dollars to restore district additional assistance so we can buy textbooks, computers, school buses, that capital has not been there since 2009. And the result is it's as precious as our M&O dollars are. There's almost been, there has been a reversal of M&O dollars to capital to buy the resources so our teachers can teach. So there are there is a broad consensus to getting the governor's district additional assistance budget proposal adopted for schools. Um, Bruce mentioned the Prop 301 extension. My bill in the Senate is dead. The only reason my bill existed was when Doug asked me to sign on to his and then ran over and dropped it. Uh, he had so many legislators come up to him and say, I would have signed, I would have signed. So he called me up and said, could you do a mirror bill? And then we'll see how many signatures we get. 57 signatures. And I tell you, there would have been more, uh, but I needed to drop it because the deadline was approaching. So Doug's bill, Doug Coleman's bill in the House, Representative Coleman, sorry, uh, proposes proposes the 
extension of Prop 301, and my bill, in essence, was to get the signatures. Doug's bill is a live bill. It was read out of and voted out of Education Committee. It was double assigned, but while it's not generally public, uh, the Ways and Means Chairman waived it out of her committee. So the struggle now is to get it on a House Rules Agenda and get it to the floor and get it voted out. It needs a two-third majority. What happened to it in the Education Committee was it, we put an eight-year sunset on the bill as opposed to just extending it in perpetuity. That was to satisfy some Republican colleagues who didn't want it going on in perpetuity. And we amended one of the buckets just to show, yes, we can do this. There are 10 buckets to Prop 301. We amended one of the buckets directing the funds to teacher salary. None of this takes effect before 2021. The key with this bill, and I do agree with Robert Robb, it is the most consequential consequential bill of the session, we need to start having those conversations now. Everybody, for the most part, agrees, yes, we need to extend Prop 301. What should that look like? People fly off in 100 different directions. We need to extend Prop 301, and we need time to do that. And the question that I am asking when they say, yeah, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. Why not now? Why not now? So that's the question we're asking. In addition, um, there are lots and lots of legislative initiatives going through. Um, and from a personal basis, we're trying to make the Sonorosaurus a state dinosaur. Yes. That's my happy bill. We are regulating sober living homes. Uh, that's another piece of legislation I'm working on. And I was so blessed to be asked to carry a striker that would restore funding to repair, rebuild State Highway uh, 189. And I am so all in on that bill. As we pelt toward the finish with the adoption of a budget and the, the last minute rush to get every bill out of session that lawmakers can get out, um, I just wanted again to thank all of you for the opportunity to work with you, to learn more about your issues, your struggles, the things that you're doing. My call to action to you would really focus around extending Prop 301. Give people the time to breathe, the time to work. Appoint a task force to begin building the Prop 301 of tomorrow. Make the cliff go away because districts, community colleges, Maybe universities are starting to reallocate those dollars because they don't know if they're going to be there. That's my call to action to you, my request for help, um, and I'd be glad to open the floor for any questions until I get the hook. And Senator McGee, thank you very much. We, we appreciate those words. We've got time for a few questions from the center before we ask Representative Hernandez to join us on stage. Senator, first of all, thank you for the work you're doing. We really appreciate it. Um, here's where we're concerned. 301's extension seems like a slam dunk. Even with that in place, we're a billion dollars below on a per kid basis where we were in 2008, so obviously we need more. A concern we have is if the legislature goes through the effort to get a two-thirds vote for a simple extension of 301 and does it now, that they might say, we've done our job, we don't want to entertain any other funding for any other reasons, and it could end up being a net behind instead of including it as a cluster as part of other things? What's your view on our concern? I think it's a very valid concern. Um, I think with the eight-year window, and also uh, don't forget that Prop 123 you know, sunsets, I think, in 2025. Uh, I think the greater concern is pushing it right up to the edge um, and phasing out and having schools phase out those funds when they are desperately needed in the classroom. As of 2021, um, whatever happens becomes not voter protected. Um, so I think that is, I think if you push districts into a corner and the reforms that everybody's talking about, Daniel's caucus is talking about it, my caucus is talking about it, and I can tell you it's way two different sets of reforms. 
we need to get together. It, it's far more important to start having those conversations now about what the new 301 would look like. And if we go all the way up to the end and roll um, a package, I don't want schools to be put in a position of having to say, okay, we'll take it. It needs to be bipartisan. And it needs to be an open public discussion on what the 301 looks like. That's my opinion. So. Senator, along the same lines, if, if the legislature acts, it does remove the voter protection from 301 and, and put 301 in, in more of a statutory uh, mode. Would you comment a little, not having read the bill completely in its current form, would you comment a little more on the issue? You mentioned the sunset at, at eight years. Um, is the language there such that the legislature couldn't at any time between now and the eight-year sunset undo what they did in this piece of legislation? That's part of the concern as well. Okay, here's my understanding is that it is voter protected through 2021. And when uh, my genius friend, Representative Doug Coleman, was looking at this and trying to figure out the configuration of votes, what his bill does requires a two-thirds as opposed to a three-quarter votes. Everything takes effect the day after um, Prop 301 expires. So we're good up until 2021. And then this extension takes place but, um, and, for, and runs for eight years for a sunset. We picked eight years because that seems to be how long my Republican colleagues enjoy extending agencies. It used to be 10, now they like eight. Um, I just think it's a greater good here, but the efforts that we would make would not undo that voter protection until after 2021. Does that answer your question? Well, but after 2021, it's the vote of the legislature could undo that. After 2021, it is free for all. Although the voter, the mandates stay in place, the funding doesn't. 